All right, people. This time around, we are going to look at using Venn diagrams to represent categorical claims, just individual categorical claims. We learned last time that categorical claims are of the form A, E, I, or O. An A claim is all SRP, E claim no SRP, and so on. Um, we'll repeat those in a bit. So we're going to try to come up with these diagrams that help us to pictorially understand what's going on with these claims. Um, once we get more advanced, we're going to represent multiple claims at once, uh, representing the premises of an argument, to use the Venn diagram to uh, help us figure out whether the argument is valid. And that'll be a bunch of fun. So be patient, and we'll get to the fun stuff. All right, but now just the basics of Venn diagrams with single claims. Okay, so take, first of all, A claims. such as okay. all cats are orange things. Okay. And I say orange things instead of just orange because we want to come up with categories with, with terms both our subject term and our predicate term, that we can just splice out of there and into another claim. And we wouldn't want to be, be switching these things around and be saying, all orange are cats. That just doesn't make sense grammatically. But if we give it a proper name for a category, such as orange things, then it's easy to switch these things around in different claims and say things like, all orange things are cats. And that makes perfect sense. So we add in things sometimes to make it easy. All right. So for this, uh, we want to create a Venn diagram that represents the relationship between these two categories. Since there are two categories, and that's all we're dealing with with our categorical logic, we need two circles. Remember, circles in categorical logic are always going to represent individual categories. So let's get those circles out there. There's one circle. There's another circle. Now, there are three different spaces in this picture. These two circles overlap in one area because we want some space to represent the intersection between them. Okay. Now, the first one represents the subject, which in this case is cats. And the second one represents the predicate term, which in this case is orange things. We'll use O for that. C for cats and O for orange things. Pretty simple. Okay, so think of each of these three spaces, one, two, and three. Think of them as being places that an individual could be. Okay, if an individual is in space number one, that would be something that it's in the C circle, so you know it's a cat. Anything, anything that's anywhere in the C circle is going to be a cat. Okay? Anything that's in the O circle, anywhere in the O circle, is going to be an orange thing. So if it's over here in space number one, it's a cat, but it's outside of the O circle. So you know it's not an orange thing. Okay? That's space number one here. Number two, at the intersection, it's in the cat circle, and it's also in the orange thing circle. So it's going to be an orange cat. It's both a cat and an orange thing. All right, now lastly, the third space. That's the space for something that's outside of the cat circle. So it's not a cat, but it's inside the orange circle. So it is an orange thing. Those represent all the possibilities of a way th a thing could be that's in either of these circles. Okay. So how do we represent an A claim to get started? Well, we want to show that if something is a cat, then it's got to be an orange thing. 
if all cats are orange things, then it can't be the case that there's any possibility for something to be uh, a cat that's not orange. So that for us means that if something is in the C circle, the cat circle, it also has to be in the O circle, the orange thing circle. So that means that we have to just get rid of somehow the space that represents uh, something that's a cat but it's not orange. All right, so that's this first space here. Number one, that's a place in a circle for something that's a cat and not orange. If all cats are orange, nothing can be there. So what we do is we just shade it out. Okay, that signifies that nothing can be there. It's just a void. Right? Nothing's there. So that's how we represent an A claim by saying that nothing could be in this space number one. All right. Now, an E claim. That's our second kind of universal claim. Put that. Uh, we'll put it in up here. That's a claim that no S R P. Right. So uh, our example from last time. No potatoes are hairy animals. All right, so we've got potatoes and hairy animals. We'll draw our circles to represent those categories. And P is a good letter to stand for our subject term here because of potatoes and hairy animals. Um, if there's nothing else uh, when you're dealing with other claims that has an H or an A in it, either the H or the A would be appropriate here. Okay, so we'll just have P and H. Now, if no potatoes are hairy animals, then there can't be something that's both a potato and a hairy animal. Just can't be such a thing. So we want to represent um, that there's no possibility, if this is true, because what we're doing is diagramming these things as if they were true, that we want to represent that there's no possibility of something being both a potato and a hairy animal. So we're going to find that in the intersection between the two. That's right in the middle. That's where something is both in the P circle, the potato circle, and in the H circle, the hairy animal circle. So nothing can be there. So we shade out that intersection between the two circles. Nothing can be there. Now something can be there, something can be there, but nothing can be right in the middle between the two. Because that's just what the claim says. Okay. So that's how we represent our universal claims, A and E claims, by shading areas out. 